George Monbiot, my brilliant colleague at The Guardian, part of the lefty contingent among the columnists there, and proof that not all superheroes wear capes. I'm a big fan, as you can tell. Not to make the guy feel old, he is after all living proof that holding left wing views is an excellent skincare routine. But his columns had a big impact to me as a young lefty, a title, alas, I don't qualify for anymore. Um, we're going to talk about one of the issues that he absolutely battered the Tories on. But I should also say, separate from this particular issue, on the question of the climate emergency, he's the most important journalist in Britain, one of the most important in the world, uh, for my money. Quite a big deal, that, given the existential threat that poses. Anyway, he did a turn on the BBC's flagship political programme, Question Time, last week, after being invited for the first time in 20 years. Ridiculous. I used to regularly appear on that show myself, of which more at the end of this video. You won't have seen me for quite a while there. But come on, the guy's got a huge following, and given how many right-wingers with much, much smaller followings than him they often have on, you've got to ask some serious questions. In any case... Unsurprisingly, he absolutely smashed his performance, despite having a dodgy throat, no doubt due to some right-wing virus or other going around. He began by taking apart the claims of his fellow panellists, the Conservative MP Johnny Mercer, who claimed that clamping down on what he describes as illegal immigration is delivering something for hard-working, ordinary women and men up and down this country. I hate that phrase. Let's listen to the big G as he takes that apart. Look, of all the hills to die on, this has got to be the most ridiculous. I mean, it's just absurd. The whole point of the Rwanda policy is not to try to solve anything. It's to performatively beat up some of the most vulnerable and traumatised people on Earth in order to distract attention... <laughs> ..to distract attention from the government's own failures. And Johnny says, this is giving the working people of this country something. The only thing this is giving the working people of this country is to show them that somebody else is worse off than they are. Because that somebody is being performatively beaten up by the government. That's the point of the policy. And we have this ridiculous new bill, which is the first one I've ever seen, which tries to legislate the nature of reality. It says, we will legislate that Rwanda is a safe country. Regardless of whether Rwanda is or is not a safe country, we will put it in the law that it is a safe country. You might as well have a bill which legislates that the moon is made of green cheese. <laughs> we have reached the point now, after 13 years of these fiascos, of total absurdity. They, they're not even intending to put this into implementation. They don't intend to make this a viable policy. They're just desperately throwing up clouds of dust in order to distract from the absolute catastrophe that this government has become for the great majority of the people of this country. <laughs> and, that, and that would be a point of mere amusement for comfortable people like ourselves sitting behind this table but it has real consequences for real people. And among those people are people who have already suffered appalling things, unspeakable things, and just desperately want refuge, a safe haven. And what do they get instead? They get a government of sadists deliberately beating them up in order to show how tough they are. Listen to that applause there. Getting a solid clap from a Question Time audience on anything to do with immigration, and that was rapturous. Given the toxic diet of xenophobia and racism being fed to the electorate on a daily basis by our media and political elites, I think that's a pretty solid win. All of George's points here are extremely well made, and his basic underlying point, which I'll come on to, is absolutely crucial to understanding why Britain, as you probably noticed looking around, is in the dire mess it's in. When he talks about some of the most vulnerable and traumatised people on Earth, well, he's absolutely correct. As I never tire of saying, there are fewer asylum seekers arriving on British shores at the turn of the century, but far more arriving by boats. Why? Because safe and legal routes for the vast majority of the world have become intentionally impossible, made intentionally impossible by the Conservative government. And it should be pointed out that most of those, of those people violently driven from their homes are internally displaced in their own country. The minority who leave their own country largely go to neighbouring countries who are much poorer than our own. Only a very small proportion end up in Europe, and of those, Britain takes in fewer than other rich countries. But when we talk about those arriving on small boats now, who are the number one nationality? The Afghans. 
Do you remember Afghanistan? You know, that war-ravaged country which Britain and other Western countries invaded and then spent two decades occupying, an occupation which helped fuel the return of the Taliban because of a vicious counterinsurgency programme. Now, you might think we have some sort of obligation to that country and its citizens, not least specifically to those Afghans who worked with the British. Like around 200 members of Afghan special forces trained and funded by the UK who now face deportation from Pakistan to Taliban-ruled Afghanistan where their lives are surely at risk. What safe and legal routes for these Afghans? After some of the other traumatised and vulnerable people. I know this, having spent a few years with, a few years ago, uh, time with refugees in the former camp that was in Calais, like the teenager whose father was killed by the Taliban, like the Darfuri who escaped a village whose other residents were burned alive, like the Eritreans fleeing a dictatorship comparable in its totalitarianism to North Korea. Overwhelmingly refugees, it should be said, who spoke English and had some form of connection here. Now, as George says, calling Rwanda a safe country is a absolute nonsense. As the author Anjan Sundaram uh, wrote of Paul Kagame, dictator of Rwanda in the New York Times earlier this year, Paul Kagame is a brutal dictator and one of the West's best friends. He's been called the Putin of Africa. Even that said, even the US State Department says of Rwanda that it has significant human rights issues, including credible reports of unlawful or arbitrary killings, torture, life-threatening prison conditions, arbitrary detention, political prisoners, serious restriction on free expression and media, uh, including threats of violence and unjustified arrests or persecution of journalists, as well as censorship, substantial interference with the rights to protest, to um, on the ability of non-government organisations to exist, we could go on. In 2018, Rwanda's police killed 13 refugees. It is not a safe country, in quotes. But a really key point is what this policy is really about. It'd be easy for people like me and George to just point out that this is a hideous way to treat such vulnerable and traumatised people by deporting them to Rwanda. And that point is an important one. But it isn't really about that. Because according to the Home Office itself, Rwanda has an initial capacity of taking around 200 people um, a year with some vague plans of that increasing after the scheme begins. 200 people a year. That is, in the grand scheme of things, a terrible tiny number of people, even if... If that actually happened, 200 people a year, it would be an outrageous assault on their human rights. The Home Office also estimates that the cost of sending someone to a supposedly safe country, that country not being specified, is nearly £170,000 compared to £106,000 if they stayed here. So it's a joke to say this is about saving money. The total cost of the scheme have already soared from £140 million to £290 million, and who knows what those costs will soar further to. And furthermore, as for the claims, this is about deterrence, to stop people considering arriving boats, uh, arriving in boats in the first place. Today, Sir Matthew Rycroft testified before MPs. He's the Permanent Secretary at the Home Office, and he admitted that there's no evidence that Rwanda deportation's flight plan has a deterrence effect. He said to the Public Account Select Committee, we don't have evidence of a deterrent effect. Now, the real crucial point, though, is George talking about performative cruelty. To show working people someone is worse off than they are, that this is the point of the policy. Bingo! That is, of course, it. Whipping up hostility against foreigners, whether they be refugees or migrants, though the distinction between the two is not as clear-cut as many of those stoking xenophobia would have you believe. But the point is to deflect public fury away from those who are actually responsible for the plight of those the Tory MP on Question Time described as hard-working, ordinary men and women up and down this country. So whether that be, I don't know, the longest squeeze in wages since the Napoleonic Age, a country where most people in poverty are in working households, earning their poverty day after day. Their social security entitlements slashed. Bear in mind, millions of low-paid workers depend on in-work benefits because their wages are just so low. Their public services falling apart, not least the NHS, or literally schools. A dire public infrastructure. A housing crisis which hammers those trapped on waiting lists for social housing or private renters charging big charge rip-off rents by landlords or homeowners with soaring mortgages. We could go on. It is pretty endless, that list. But George is onto something really important here. It's not just, as I often say, about scapegoating, though that is important. As an example, making people think, well, the NHS is in a mess, not because the Tories won't fund it properly and resource it properly, but because of foreigners. Even though, without foreign-born nurses and doctors, the NHS would fall like that overnight. That there's a housing crisis, not because of the failure to build housing, not least because the Tories flogged off council housing and didn't replace that stock, leaving people at 
the mercy of private landlords charging through the nose to make people think, no, the housing crisis is caused by foreigners or living standards having having such an unprecedented squeeze for working people, not because of smashed trade unions and austerity and other dire economic policies that favour the rich, again, because of foreigners. But this, that is important, scapegoating. But there is a point George is also alluding to, which is something else. So look, as an example, to the Deep South in the US and the historic plight of poorer whites. So, of course, you had the American Civil War in the 19th century, the liberation of the slaves. But after that, you got Jim Crow laws which continued the horrendous oppression of black Americans. Now, the one thing that would always have terrified the Southern white elites is for poorer whites to make common cause with black Americans, not least on economic and social justice issues they should have always been united over. But they were divided, and poorer whites were made to feel they had superiority and privilege that helped suppress their living standards. They lined up behind racist politicians who supported policies which hobbled workers' unions and opposed policies that would actually have improved their living standards. You can see the same principle here. Because the mess this country is in is partly because of obsessive anti-migrant hostility whipped up by our rulers and their media allies. The Conservatives, like so many right-wing political parties throughout history, owe much of their power to stoking up bigotry against the foreigner. And then they ride that wave to enact policies which make the lives of ordinary Britons worse. So they fearmonger about your life will be made worse because of foreigners, migrants, refugees, whoever, and they manipulate that fear and impose policies that actually do make people's lives worse. So a lot of the state of this country is directly linked to migrant and refugee bashing. So well done on George for his star turn. The applause was, I think, beyond justified. Just to return to my other point about question time, not to sound bitter or anything. I used to be a regular on the show. I used to be on like once a year or so. Haven't been on for four years or so. It's, been, it's you know, I, I try not to take these things personally. Um, appearing on question time, I always enjoyed doing it. I think it's a, an, an important show. It's not a human right of mine. It's obviously up to the team running it who appears on it and who doesn't. Don't want to write my own reviews and sound like an arrogant so-and-so. But I always, always found I got a pretty good response when I went on. Anyway, the last time I was sounded out to appear was back in December 2019. A couple of months later, I wrote a column criticising the show with how it dealt with racism. Haven't heard from them ever since. It's their shout. Um... Not a bit of man. But as you can see from George, I do think there's a very big appetite for those of us offering an alternative to the political and media consensus. Indeed, I think you can see it from, for example, the videos done by myself, Navara, etc. on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the audio podcast. They've got an ever-exploding audience. Our audiences are exploding exponentially at the moment. And mine get across platforms millions per month. Navara are doing even better. So I guess if those platforms are no longer as forthcoming in terms of the older platforms, to put it that way, I think we'll still be able to reach people. And on that note, do like and subscribe. Do share this video or podcast. I should stop neglecting the podcast. People do listen there. Hello to you. You can keep the show on the road on patreon.com forward slash owenjones84. We have huge amounts of coverage coming up um, on not least the hideous assault on Palestine. We've got lots of videos coming up and interviews uh, this week, including with uh, Yanis uh, Raifakis, a former IDF soldier and Palestinian voices. Uh, so do check those out, but I will speak to you soon. Take care in a bit.